welcome to the finale of Veiled Chameleon Week. And we've spent the entire week uh, going over various aspects of the chameleon. And the, uh, of course, the big news is that I finally released the uh, the update for the 2022 Veiled Chameleon uh, Care Summary. And this has been a, a bigger job than it has been in the past because I've totally redone it, uh, looked over all the information, and I um, expanded it, uh, more, more than doubled it uh, as far as the information going in there. Uh, but that's that's really what I want these care summaries to be, <clears throat> excuse me, is to uh, have it be more of a care booklet. It's uh, it's starting to be uh, become, and I like that. Uh, hello, Bears and Elise. Well, you know what, Elise? Uh, Elise says she has so many questions. Uh, you know what? Just if they, especially if they're about veiled chameleons, let's uh, let's try to uh, keep it on veiled chameleons. But go ahead and just uh, anybody has questions, put them in the comments now. Uh, uh, and so I'll we'll just start talking. I mean, I I've spent the entire week explaining the care summaries, so uh, I don't need to review that all here. So I, I I'm fine just talking about uh, any questions that you have. Hello, Black Label Homestead. Good to see you here. Um, Emerald Garrett's back. Yay! Now now the the, the important thing is, I just want to say that first of all. I, the wonderful thing about community and husbandry is we are learning so much. And, and this isn't because it's all of a sudden raining on us and uh, we're catching it. We're working hard in the community. And I, I mean, I know that that's the reason why I have the Chameleon Academy is because I want to push chameleon husbandry forward. And so I am actively going out into the community and finding who is trying new things. And I talking to them i'm developing the ideas i'm bringing them in front of the public i mean the whole uh the whole talk about bioactive this is a very exciting aspect uh, it's a new frontier for us chameleon people and so uh, i'm really happy to dive into it this year and so that's what the chameleon academy is all about and when you do that every single week you are looking for what's going on there is no way that you can not change things and so I uh, expect th this is why I say every year or two, the care summaries will be updated and I'm going to keep them as uh, up to date as possible. So it's okay if this, what we're seeing talking about today is different than what we did last year or the year before. Uh, the, I, I know if you've done, if you've done something for 10 years and it's been working for you for 10 years, you're saying, why should I change? And I'm going to say, okay. Well, what you're doing is working. You're happy with it. Then that's fine. The po the point of the community, uh, academy is not to change everybody. It's to explore the new frontiers. And if you want to explore the new frontiers with me, then I'm very happy to have you. If you want to keep doing what you've been doing for ten years, if it works, that's fine too. Um, you know, we're, we're we can live in the same world. So, let's see. Bears Corners asking, my chameleon Yoshi loves to come out of his home and hang out for a few minutes at a time. Since the weather is warming up here in Oregon, is it safe to take him outside for little stretches? It is great to take him out for little stretches. It is great to give them the natural sunlight. I mean, we what we do with artificial lights is sufficient, and we can grow up a uh, veiled chameleon indoors perfectly healthy, but nothing matches being out there in the sun with breezes and the ebb and flow of the humidity and i i love i keep my veiled chameleons outdoors as often as much of the year as possible and uh and so i absolutely encourage it now the one thing you've got to watch out for is confining them in too small of an area because the sun is powerful and if you if they don't have the cover to get out of it, it's amazing how quickly that sun can kill. So you got to be very careful to give them a large enough area to move around and a well-planted area to move around that they can adjust and find their comfort level. Uh, and so that's the big caveat. You got to watch out for 
um, the sun and of course predators and such and them getting away and all that kind of wonderful stuff. But uh, yes, I absolutely encourage you to get out into the natural sunlight as much as possible. Um, hey Bill, how old oldest veiled chameleon you have seen in captivity? Well, uh, Elise West, who has joined us here, had one that was, she says, 15 years old. Um, I'm thinking, and we're going to get our veiled chameleons living longer and longer. Uh, one of the things that is important to reptiles, I remember my uh, episode on the dry season with you and Edwards, where we talked about, yeah, the dry season kills a lot of chameleons, but it also gives them a season, an entire season of rest. And we talked about how that's important to longevity. So imagine a scenario where right now we are supercharged chameleons, burning them out quickly. Uh, they live fast, live bright, and then die. Uh, what we can do for longevity if we, number one, lower our temperatures that we're keeping them at, and then even give them a, a dry season, a lower temperatures uh, of a dry season, so essentially a season of rest. And, and so I think we're going to be able to see the longevity just uh, spike up, just on the logic that we are not pushing them to live as fast as we have traditionally done. Now, how are you going to prove something like that? Well, you know, I'll tell you in 15 years, it's this is going to be a long-term thing. So right now we just have to project and say, yeah, okay, that makes sense. Um, let's see. Yeah, this is one I wanted to talk about from Derek. Uh, the whole thing about female veiled chameleons laying infertile eggs. It is common for female veiled chameleons to develop a clutch of infertile eggs because we supercharge them. If you are keeping your chameleon at those, you know, 90 and above basking, you are supercharging your veiled chameleons. And yes, the community has, uh, uh, reacted to that, not by changing the basking temperature and fixing the problem, but by saying, okay, you've always got to have a lay bin in the cage to uh, be there for these eggs that will always happen. Uh, even veterinary, uh, veterinarians are proactively spaying female chameleons to save their lives. And uh, it, it's just, it's crazy that instead of fixing the husbandry parameter that causes these things, we're coming up with all these different uh, ways of dealing with it. So uh, if you keep your chameleon at, say, a lower basking temperature, I'm going to 85, some people have gone to 80, uh, and don't feed them, overfeed them, they either don't produce infertile clutches or they produce much lower uh, count eggs in their infertile clutches. But your chameleon is does not it is not for sure thing that your chameleon will develop an infertile clutch. And so what you're looking for is uh, if they have, will develop, it, you're going to notice that they're going to get rounder. You're not going to be able to tell this by the color. Uh, they're going to get rounder. You're going to notice them getting rotund because they're filling with eggs. And then right before they lay the eggs, they're going to be walking around the bottom of the cage. So if your female is not growing rotund, uh, you know, they'll, they'll look like a barrel, uh, and they're not showing any behavior signs of walking around the bottom of the cage, then there's probably no eggs there. And at the very least, she's not ready to lay. So don't, don't expect that it has to happen uh, immediately after whatever colors or patterns you think you saw. So I, uh, from what you're telling me, she's not showing any signs that she needs a laying in. Um, it is, you know, you can, uh, you can uh, type in if you see uh, in the comments section, Derek, just uh, let me know what si are you seeing any behavior signs uh, or are you only going off of uh, some patterns that you thought uh, you saw before? Uh, yeah, let me know. We, we can continue to discuss this. Um, there we go. Here's a good question. Black Label says. I'm a new veiled chameleon keeper, uh, chameleon keeper. 
And like your girl will purposely stay away from the fog at night. So far, I'm sure she I'm sure she is not getting any benefit. Should I use a diffuser across the enclosure or leave it be? Uh well, the whole idea between the for the fogger is that you raise the ambient humidity uh so they don't dehydrate during the night. Uh if she is not uh sleeping under the fog, that pretty much probably means that she doesn't need it. And so uh, what I would do is I would just keep it there and just as an option for her to uh, use it if she wants it. Uh, it depends on uh, what's your ambient humidity. If you're if you're living in an area where the ambient humidity is high uh, and she's hydrated, she may may not need it. Uh, and if, I mean, if you live in a dry area, they, they'd love the fogger. But So uh, what, what are your, you can type in in the chat or some of your uh ambient conditions because you may not have a problem here and it's if she's not using it uh that that may be a good sign i mean when when i do my hydration test during the day i have a dripper going on and i want them to ignore it that tells me that my hydration uh all their hydration that i'm doing is good and that's exactly why i do it and i love it when they ignore it when they go to drink from it that's when i know i've got to do something different so uh what you may be seeing may be good news of course, we need to learn a little bit more about your situation, but on the surface, uh, consider that uh, th this may be a sign that things are good. Um, <laughs> little Scuff said, uh, listen to the, there is a, a, a podcast on uh, Carpentary, uh, Kinyonga Carpentary. It's another chameleon that has a cask like a veiled chameleon, and uh, but totally different different conditions, different chameleon. Uh, let's see, Elise is asking, what does bee pollen do for chameleons? And the question is, uh, <clears throat> we don't know for sure. It's one of those things that we, uh, it's kind of nature's superfood and we, uh, we know they eat bees and pollinators in the wild. And so it's a logical thing that we say, okay, this sounds like this could work and this could be a very good thing. Uh, the problem with chameleon nutrition, it, it is exceedingly difficult to test uh, what is good and what isn't because you have to isolate things. Uh, and you, there's just, how do you isolate nutrition? Uh, I mean, you can, scientists can do it, but at this point, the whole focus on bee pollen is because it makes sense, not because we have anything to point to. So it's all part of trying to give our chameleons the best nutrition we can. And unfortunately, we're working with not a whole lot of solid information when it comes to reptile nutrition. Little Scuff says, can they reabsorb the eggs? Yes. Uh, there comes a point where they can uh, uh, reverse it and say, okay, we're not going to do the whole egg thing. Uh, now, once they start calcifying the eggs, they're, you start, start to get to the point where you can't reverse it, but uh, there is a point where they can. Um, okay, Derek is coming back on that situation. He's the one who has the uh, chameleon. He's wondering if she's needing to lay. Uh, and he saw patterns most closely identified with being receptive. Uh, okay, uh, don't don't go by patterns. Those can be very deceptive. And being receptive doesn't mean she's going to start an egg laying process. Uh, so I, I think if you don't see any behaviors or any growth in the uh, the torso, I, I don't think your chameleon has a, a bunch of eggs coming in. Uh, you can see like this chameleon here in the, um, in the picture. All right, let's go ahead and go to the breeding section. Um, to do, to do, to do. Two, three. Okay, one more. Give me one more here. There we go. So you can see upper left, that is a female veiled chameleon that is receptive. So you see, if you see those colors, um, okay, she could be receptive, but it doesn't mean she's going to start. Uh, her process. This chameleon, right, uh, if you 
go right below it, the one that's black, that is a chameleon, a veiled chameleon that is gravid. Now, you can't really see in this picture how large her belly is. <clears throat> and you're not going to see those colors all the time because uh, those kind of colors are generally reserved to let the male know that uh, there's uh, to go knock on someone else's door uh, that she's gravid. But you're going to you're going to see a noticeable growth in that belly uh, for when when those eggs are to be developing. Um, We have, uh, is the goal to stop infertile clutches or allow for a cycle, but with low clutch sizes? Both. Um, the goal would be no infertile clutches, um, but if they are going to have an infertile clutch, it's to have a low clutch size. And so we're, we're really working for both. Um, and, and it's a challenge. It's, you know, I, I give these temperatures and then I say reduce the eating, but uh, even even with that, veiled chameleons are just so incredibly efficient. And so, I, I mean, I I reduce my food, but I have my veiled chameleons outside. And so even there, with the perfect sun conditions, I got an infertile clutch of 40 eggs. And so uh, there's still so much more that we have to learn about how to do this. And uh, I'm, I'm still learning. We're all still learning. Uh, I did that interview with Marty Jokey. From uh, she's from Finland and she's been uh, having some great success. But the thing is, these successes are in isolated areas. I haven't found what can connect all of them in such a way that it will work for everybody. Uh, and so that that's one of the areas of our greatest growth in the chameleon community. Uh, and and I look forward to continuing to figure that out. Uh, that, that's going to be, uh, that's going to save so many veiled chameleon lives. Uh, so it's not, it's not just academic. I, I think it's got to be one of our top priorities in the chameleon community is to figure out how to stop supercharging our, uh, our especially female veiled chameleon. We want to take care of them. Um, okay, Elise is asking, I'm not using a fogger. But I have a sprayer that you pump. Can I use that instead? Use it on other chameleons. The difference between a fogger and a mister, and so your sprayer is acting uh, as a mister, is that a mister is, it just coats the entire area with water. And so you get this spike of humidity and you get water to drink. The fogger is meant to be a long-term thing. Uh, you're looking for hours and hours, six hours of increased humidity because what the fogger is doing is allowing your chameleon to breathe in the very humid air breathing in a cloud and that stops the dehydration and so you know you breathe in we all know this you breathe in dry air and you are thirsty because you've lost so much moisture just from breathing uh we have a whole group who believes that it even goes further and it actually hydrates uh, i'm not uh, i'm not to that point where i'm comfortable saying that um so I'm not going to go that far publicly and such, uh, but I do know it does stop dehydration. And so what you're, the mister doesn't do that. Now, it would do that if you could run the mister for six hours. The problem is, of course, what you do with all the water. And so that's why a fogger is, is brought in. Uh, so uh, you, you, they're, they're not interchangeable. They do totally different jobs. Uh, See, Donut Gaming is saying, what's better, glass or net, screen, mesh, uh, the one with the tiny holes. And the enclosure that's best depends upon your ambient conditions. The closer your conditions are to what they need, the more screen you use, mesh or net, uh, the more you need to change the conditions from what your ambient conditions are, the more solid sides you need. So if you live in a very dry environment, uh, a solid side enclosure that holds in the humidity is necessary. If you live in an area where veiled chameleons could live uh, live outside, you'd use a screen. I uh, would not live outside. If you keep them outside where the in conditions, or if they're inside and there are conditions that veiled chameleons can live in, uh, you don't need to change the environment much inside the cage so you can use screen. And so 
think of it as solid sides. The more solid sides you have, the more control you have over the internal environment and to create a different environment inside the cage than is on the outside. So your question is, I mean, the, the answer to this question is different for every single person. What is the conditions in the room that the veiled chameleon is going to be kept? And how close are they to the uh, care summary condition, uh, situation? I will say that <clears throat> the one thing that is very difficult to do in a screen cage is to maintain the humidity. And so what you, and, and in a normal house, you can't have 80 to 900% humidity or the paint will peel. Uh, even bathrooms, they, the bathrooms have special paint because of uh, all the humidity from the shower. Well, your your library or den probably doesn't have that. Uh, but that's that's the reason is because uh, all the high humidity will do that. I, I learned this because I decided it'd be great to get one of those greenhouse uh, humidifiers, put it in my garage. Well, I learned that my garage was not designed to, uh, to uh, contain a cloud every night. So uh, I think that's the reason why a hybrid cage is actually the most, uh, the, the cage most uh, people should be using. It's uh, because of the humidity. Um, okay, uh, here is uh, that nighttime humidity. Uh, for the veiled chameleon that refused, wasn't interested in sleeping under the uh, the fogger. Uh, 40 to 60 is, I, mean, I guess, we're just going to have to trust your chameleon that it knows what it's doing. You All, all you're responsible for, provide the options. It's the, up to the chameleon to decide. And we don't stop providing the options just because they're not using it. We provide the options so it's always there if the chameleon decides they need it. And so if it gets, for some reason, the chameleon's dehydrated, then they will go find that fogger. And so I think it's important to continue doing that. Uh, and you just adjust to what your chameleon wants. Now, I do say turn off the basking lamp if your chameleon's not using it. And that's because during the day, the heat rises and so uh the basking lamp isn't necessary and is just adding unnecessary heat into the system and so that's why i say you know it's it's let's let's think about turning off the heat lamp uh, and removing that as an option that's because heat lamp is to heat up and that actually is happening during the day so that, that covers that but for fogger i continue doing it and offering it as an option for her to choose from Let's see. Uh, let's see. We have a question about uh, key. I don't know if you're going to be able to see the entire question here. Um, had a new chameleon, had a case in M MBD. Doing amazing now. Is this something he's more susceptible to now? No, his MBD is not something you're like more susceptible to. I'm, I'm sure there's some genetic component, but. Uh, if you have enough calcium and vitamin D3 in your system, you don't have MBD. And so, I, I, I mean, that's a grossly simplistic way of looking at it. There's always complications, but generally speaking, it's not something that you have to worry about. Um, like, like when you get a bee sting and then you get an allergic reaction, the next time you get a bee sting, you're much more sensitive to it. That's, it's not like that for MBD. Um, see, well, we've got a, Ooh, Hey, Jarek, good to see you here. Let's see. Got a lot of, uh, I'm going to catch up with all of these questions. Uh, at least asking, will putting a chameleon that's used to a full screen enclosure be okay. If you put it in a hybrid enclosure, will it adjust to not being able to see all around the enclosure? Yes. It uh, it depends on how big the enclosure is and how much the chameleon, every chameleon is different. And when you change their situation, you know, they'll react differently. You're, you're right to be looking out for, there's a couple of things to look out for. Uh, the chameleon may, may say, what are these walls? Most chameleons will say, oh, okay, now I'm safe because I can't be attacked from these different directions. And so it's a good thing. But you could have your chameleon, if he's used to uh, always 
sitting up on the branch and serving his domain, uh, he may say, wait a minute, where did my domain go? So, you know, it's good to watch out for that. Um, another thing to uh, watch out for is usually the acrylic cages have the acrylic front or the hybrid cages have the acrylic front. Uh, depending upon how your lights are situated, you could have a reflection in the uh, acrylic front. Most chameleons learn that this ghost chameleon doesn't mean anything or will never come inside their cage. And so, I mean, I, mine have absolutely no problem with it. Uh, so, uh, but if you put an adult chameleon who's never seen it before, it may take them a while to settle down. Uh, and so uh, you can adjust, adjust where the lights are. That changes how the reflection is, but that's something to watch out for as well. Um, let's see. Um, Stephen Kemp is asking, my veiled chameleon is always a darker color in his cage. Not sure what I'm doing wrong. Um, what I can do is I can give you some ideas. Of course, I don't know your exact situation. And uh, so you just uh, pick and choose what applies to you. Darker colors can be uh, three things. Uh, one is heat. They, they need a uh, they, they want to be warmer. Uh, two is uh, light. They tend to have <clears throat> muted colors when they don't have enough light. I use a, a quad a T5 fixture with three daylight bulbs and one UVB bulb and then an Arcadia uh, Jungle Dawn LED bar. So I'm giving my chameleons all sorts of light. Uh, and third, they could feel uh, feel submissive. And are they seeing other chameleons? Are, are I, they're not in a cage with another chameleon? But do they see another chameleon? Were they were they in a cage with another chameleon? And maybe they're not over it. So that's those are the three main conditions. Now, if you're talking about a panther chameleon, um, there are cases where they just go gray, and we don't know why. I don't know why. I just had one that spent six months a beautiful uh ambilobe uh and just uh, i mean reds yellows blues all over gorgeous and he decided to go gray literally gray for six months and i have no idea i mean he had every he had everything good he had natural sunlight and uh, everything he needed and he just wanted to gray. so there's a lot of things it could be, and uh, yeah, it's uh, sometimes a challenge to figure out what it is. Um, okay, Donut Gaming, we'll go here. My veil is out, always at the top of the enclosure, staying close as to the lamp as possible. I'd like to ask, is a glass or netted enclosure better for keeping in heat and humidity? Well, a glass or hybrid cage is designed to keep in heat and humidity, so that's, yes, it's much better. Now, if you have a screen enclosure, you can always put plastic along the sides, whether it's a shower curtain, chlor uh, chloroplast, or even uh, shrink, uh, shrink fit window film. Uh, and that's going to keep the humidity in, not so much temperature. Uh, yours may be looking for warmer. Uh, I would be very careful about putting a heat lamp directly on the surface of the uh, the, the top of the cage because uh, even the the uh, weaker wattage heat lamps uh, you get within an inch of that thing and that's hot uh, they may dissipate quickly they may not have much punch into the cage but an inch away from that bulb is very hot and if they have access to it by being uh, on the top of the cage they could absolutely burn themselves and they will chameleons do not seem to have this uh, they, they have this switch that says, I need to warm up, but they don't seem to have the, uh, the ability to discern at different, oh, wow, this is too hot. They don't have that, uh, that I am burning right now uh, signal to get to their brain. And they will just sit there and they will literally burn because uh, there's just something that they don't have. I mean, of course, they haven't had to develop that because they've never been near something that can burn them like that. So... Uh, we have to be very careful as to the maximum energy levels of lights that we put into the cage. And this is for uh, heat and UVB. Uh, so we 
have to have uh, an idea in our head as to what the maximum level that goes into our cage because our chameleons crawl on the top of the cage. Bearded dragon people don't have to worry about uh, what the temperature is at the top of the cage. We do. Uh, it's just, just part of what we do. All right. Let's go. I'm trying to catch up with all of the comments. Um, yeah, yeah. No, talking about uh, larger clutch sizes, uh, 64 eggs. Bears had a female that had 64 eggs. Uh, me too. And that's way too much. But oh, it's not as bad as 100 eggs. Oh, my goodness. It, can you imagine the female that had to carry around 100 eggs and lay 100 eggs? Ow. Um. <laughs> and now we got people talking about carpet chameleons and helmeted chameleons. Um, yeah, yeah, don't worry. I talk about them all the time and I will continue to talk about them. They don't get as much attention as veiled chameleons because so many people have veiled chameleons. And so I, I focus where the people are, but don't worry. Carpet chameleons and uh, helmeted chameleons, they'll keep coming up. They'll keep coming up. Um <laughs> Um, uh, all right, here we have a situation where, um, a chameleon mounted his hand. Um, uh, no, it's not a dominance thing. It is a mating thing and he's confused. This human world has so many different signals and different things that they were never, their instinct never told them what to do with. And so sometimes they, they try to mate with our hand that yes, that happens. Um, oh, here. Oh, yes. I love. Oh, I love. Uh, Team Moss says uh, we breed veils in South Africa. Interesting to see what temperatures they can handle. It's winter here now. They can handle it to about five degrees Celsius before we bring them in at night. They're very, really hardy. Yes, it is amazing how low they can go. And if you go to my podcasts, uh, I did a whole series on veiled chameleons, and you can you I've listed them all in the uh, the veiled chameleon uh, care the summary. This uh, the uh, the link that you see at the top of this uh, care summary. If you go there, you see a whole list of podcasts where I did a like five different podcasts about veiled chameleons, and in one of them I uh, interviewed Ron Tremper, who's the first person to bring veiled chameleons into the United States. And he talked about how they were outside during an ice storm. And he just assumed he lost them all because he was out of the, out of town when this thing hit. He came in the morning and yeah, okay, everything was uh, probably dead. Uh, but by afternoon when the sun came out, they just started coming back to life and crawling up in the trees. And so veiled chameleons are amazing creatures and <laughs> incredibly hardy. Now, of course, I don't recommend doing that, but uh, this, is, this is a great observation. And, and, you know, I, being cold at night, now that's not, not really a problem from, uh, that's not a really a reptile problem. It's the heat. Uh, thank you. Thank you for that, uh, observation. That's great. Um, let's see. Jarek is asking my adult female eats all of her bugs really quickly. And he feeds a good mix. That's a great uh, diversity. Usually give seven bugs. Should I increase the amount? No, no. Uh, this is a trap. This is a trap, Jarek. Beware. Uh, veiled chameleons will eat way more than they need to. And that's why we have such a problem with obesity in veiled chameleons. And, and this is not... And the owners are just doing what they're supposed to do. They're taking their cues from the chameleon. Okay, they're being observant. Chameleon, what do you need? And and the veiled chameleon saying, I need more, I need more. Uh, there are a couple of points where we have to be careful not to give chameleons what they ask for. Um, and that is excess heat, excess UVB, and excess food. These are three things that they, they don't have a good sense of when it's too much, especially veiled chameleons. So uh, I would go down to uh, I do three to five bugs, appropriately sized bugs every other day. Uh, and it's just, um, but keeping a watch on that female, uh, and make sure she's not, you know, I, I, I she's not growing out because, uh, every extra calorie that you give her will, could potentially go to egg production. And chameleons really 
don't do a lot during the day. They're not a high energy species running around and doing laps. They sit around. So they're not really burning a lot of calories. We got to make sure that we feed them and they have enough to uh, survive. Um, and, and, and that's not an easy thing for me to say, okay, here's the line. Uh, so you got to be observant, but uh, I, I would not give her more. Uh, keep her, keep her hungry. And that's, it's the best for her. I mean, I love a big chameleon just like anybody else. And then, yes, I spent a long time overcharging my veiled chameleons because I thought that was the best thing to do. I thought that was the healthiest. Hey, they're bigger. And oh, the, the clutch size is a hundred eggs, 60 eggs. I must be doing something right because that's healthy. And yeah, uh, it was very, it was disappointing when I found out how wrong I was. And that's just part of growing as a human being and learning and moving forward. Yeah, yeah, yes, yes. Let's see. Okay, give me a second to go run through all of all of these. I'm catching up on the the um the comments. And everybody, yeah, I love love seeing all the comments. Everybody's uh, very active. So here's little scuff said, so chameleons don't ever stop growing. Is that just veils are all chameleons. They do not stop growing. They grow their entire life, but they slow way down once they get to a certain point. So once they get to adult size and sexually mature, uh, it's like a shot from the gun when they're getting up, growing up to being mature, especially veiled chameleons. But once they get uh, uh, fully mature, they keep growing, but it's at a much slower pace. Uh, so, I mean, every time you're, you're chameleon, you'll notice you can follow the sheds when they're growing up, you can get a shed every week, uh, from a veiled chameleon. Um, but when they're, uh, adults, you may get one every six months. And so you're, everything slows down and, and see, that's, that's important for us to realize and to keep track of because, uh, when they're growing fast, that's when we want to give, when they're growing up to maturity, that's when we want to give them all the food they can eat because they need that to grow. Their body's going to want to grow. And if we don't give them enough to grow, they'll grow, they'll grow unhealthy or they'll be stunted or AD. Uh, but once they get to an adult size and they stop that breakneck speed of growth, that's when we need to say, oh, okay, I think it's time to pull back and, uh, and go down to the maintenance mode of feeding. And, and, and it's not like a black and white, oh, okay, uh, I'm, uh, now's the point. And so you can just keep feeding. And when they start, like the cask starts puffing up and you notice they start to get more rotund than they were before, then you can say, okay, it's time to back off. And so there, there's always the ability to back off. You, you, don't, it, it's, you don't have to panic over it. Um, it's a long-term thing. Um, uh, and, and by the way, once a fem uh, female veiled chameleon is developing eggs, I mean, once she, those eggs are fertilized, uh, then I, I give her all she'll eat at that point because uh, we hold back on the amount of, of food they eat so the body doesn't say, okay, this is the land of plenty so I can make 100 eggs. Uh, we want to be uh, very... Um, uh, have a, a strict diet before that. And so when she's, uh, her body's making the decision as to how many eggs to create, it says, okay, we only have a, this much amount of food. So let's only create this much amount of eggs. But once that decision is made, then she needs all the, uh, everything she'll eat. So, because those eggs are going to take a lot out of her. Uh, and then once they're laid, we go back to the three to five every other day. Um, uh, let's see, let's see, um, <laughs> and, uh, Jerick is saying, thank you very much. Try to keep the basking at 82 to keep the eggs down. Yeah. I say 85, but 82 and some people say 80. And so this is a uh, uh, great data points for people in the community to do this and show that this is working at these levels, the better, the better. I I'm very careful not to just take my experiences when I'm putting together these care sheets, because I have a certain set of conditions that are completely different 
anywhere else in the world. And so uh, I've we've got to be careful about our personal experiences and how important they are. They're definitely valuable data points, but uh, we don't know that they are universally accurate until people from totally other areas uh, confirm that, yes, this works for me too. So um, it's very good to hear from all of you, your experiences in what levels of uh, these lower basking temperatures you're working with and what are successful. Uh, so thank you, Jarek. Um, is it normal for a veil to misfire at her food? Sometimes she misses the bug the first try. No, it's not normal. Sometimes it happens when they are nervous or intimidated by the food item, and so they don't uh, don't put it all behind it. Uh, but if it's happening on a regular basis, you might want to check into that um, and and see what may be going on, um, or you know maybe a behavior thing. So I'm not saying that they're definitely something wrong, but uh, keep an eye on it. That's the answer is no, that's not normal, uh, but may or may not be a bad thing. Um, hey, Rob is asking, what branches should I use? Watch the section on oak branches. I love oak branches. They are my absolute favorite. And, um, uh, but a lot of branches will work. I don't like pine. I don't like bamboo. Chameleons don't seem to like uh, bamboo. Uh, but other than that, uh, whatever you have around should work. As long as I'm, I mean, even have even if it has thorns. I mean, chameleons actually prefer thorn. Uh, I've seen them walk in and out of bushes that have thorns inches uh, tall. It protects them, so they can navigate the thorns. But uh, since we have such limited space inside of our cages, why why do that? So uh, and and also, when you put your hand in the cage, you don't want to have to watch out for the thorns. So, mm -hmm. right, give me a second here. Ooh, I'm back. <laughs> Here's a question. <laughs> Mikey says, I just got my chameleon yesterday. Any tips? Yeah, I got lots of videos and lots of podcasts. Get, get, pour your coffee and get comfortable. He was black yesterday and brown today, and it's hard to know if he's eating or not because I don't see it, and I don't know if he drinks either. Okay. Uh, you are now, have now entered into a realm of having to uh, figure out chameleon behavior, um, and that's a huge question. Uh, you, I would say, uh, just start watching the videos and start listening to the podcasts to learn all about chameleons. As for Black yesterday and brown today. It could be your lighting. It could be your heat. It could be your uh, the chameleon is a uh, young, uh, feels intimidated. Uh, the problem with chameleons in color is they change their color, and so there's a number of things that it could be. Uh, but it is important to look at all of those things and figure out uh, what's going on. Now, black yesterday and brown today. Okay, I consider that going in the right direction. Um, but uh, hard to know if he's eating or not because I don't see it. Well, are you seeing the insects disappear and are you seeing poop appear? Uh, if you just got your chameleon yesterday, don't worry about it uh, just yet. You're, uh, but you do, if you don't know if he's eating or not, I'm gathering you don't have your insects contained in a feeder run cup or something. Uh, and I would suggest doing that because if you just release them into the cage, yeah, you don't know. And at this point, when you just have a new chameleon, it's a good idea to be able to keep track of those kind of things. Um, okay. Black Label Home is uh, curious about if there's any trees or plants that we should avoid with chameleons. I... Well, I'll say that I don't have any information over the decades that I've done this and the vets I've talked to and the people I've talked to. I haven't run into any evidence of plant poisoning 
in a chameleon. Doesn't mean it's not out there. It just means that with all the plants we've used, I haven't seen any evidence of plant poisoning. And that includes all of the house plants at Home Depot that are on the toxic list. Croton, philodendron, uh, Epothos is on the toxic list. And these things, I have pictures on the Chameleon Academy of bites taken out of them because veils don't care what's on our toxic list and it doesn't seem to bother them. So, and it makes sense. Uh, toxic lists are species dependent. And so what's toxic to us or dogs or cats, I mean, veiled chameleon is a totally different animal. So uh, there isn't any sets, set rules as to what not to use with chameleon. Uh, bamboo, I don't like bamboo because it's slick and chameleons, when given the choice, don't tend to choose it. Uh, I don't like pine because of the, the sap and I don't like the, the rough uh, outside. I don't know that a chameleon, what a chameleon thinks about that. Um, so uh, I got to say, we don't, I don't have a list of you of what you can't use. And so I would say uh, look for branches that are uh, just the correct diameter. That's that's one thing you got to look for to where your chameleon can get uh, its halfway around or all the way around. Uh, but other than that, that's the point where we're still still learning. And I'm actually gathering information like that for the Chameleon Academy plant section. Uh, you can go with uh, chameleonacademy.com backslash plants and uh, see what what I've put together so far. But still still working. Um, builds more territorial in their enclosure more than other chameleons. They're certainly more, uh, uh, they have a lot more personality and they're willing to show it. Um, so they are much, so if a veiled chameleon and a Jackson's chameleon, of course, in separate cages, uh, are defensive and don't want to be held, your Jackson's chameleon will give you a very mean disappointed look at your life decisions. Uh, a veiled chameleon will help you realize how painful your life decisions are. So they do have that personality where, yeah, they're more likely to bite you than other species. Um, but uh, that's, I don't think that has anything to do with their enclosure uh, than where they are. They just don't want to be bothered. To do all right, going, going, going. Big Al, Bill Strand, the legend. Thank you very much. Um, all right, we have a lot of uh discussion in the chat, which is great. Which is great. Uh, let's see if there's a question for me that I can talk about. Uh, you, you guys are awesome, I love it. You're all helping each other, that's wonderful. Um, OG Trendy Gaming and Edits is asking, why does my chameleon have black dots in the cage? Um, I don't know. Uh, is that a veiled chameleon? Could be a stress response. And got to figure out what uh, what they're being stressed by. But see, so many of these things with chameleons, there's not an easy answer. It's like you need a whole uh, rundown of the entire situation. And uh, so, yeah, it's hard to uh, troubleshoot a lot of that. Um Okay, let's see, Rob Margison is asking calcium with D3 or without. Now, Rob, I gotta apologize. I don't know if you're responding to another question up there that I missed, but I'm going to assume that uh, you're asking the question and it's good for everybody uh, as for what supplementation to use. And uh, you can reference on the care sheet in the bottom right hand side. Well, what is uh, one thing I use? Uh, the problem with D3, calcium with D3, is when you give D3 through the diet, your chameleon can't regulate it. And you can give them too much D3, especially with some of the calcium with D3 supplements that we have today that just have obnoxious amounts of D3. Um, and, and they're meant for larger animals than chameleons. And that's what those were formulated for. And just so we know, Let's, let's be clear. The supplements that we have available to us, number one, were designed with best guesses as far as what reptile nutrition is uh, and probably had in mind some particular 
uh, species divide. I believe was designed for turtles or tortoises or turtles, something like that, not chameleons. And so we are dealing with, and also they also threw everything into these supplements. And so you have this su supplement that wasn't designed for a chameleon and was designed with very little knowledge of what chameleon nutrition would be and is essentially a uh, purpose. So for all reptiles. Uh, and so th there's nothing magic about any of our supplements. And so we've got to take on, sorry, excuse me, we've got to take on the responsibility of figuring out what we give to our chameleon. And so with that in mind, I'll say uh, what, what we have found is uh, effective is uh, the just the calcium during uh, or every feeding because back to the calcium cycle, if you uh, get calcium or get vitamin D3 from UVB, the body naturally cuts off the production when the, the vitamin D stores are filled. And vitamin D3 is a fat soluble vitamin. So it's not going to flush out and you can overdose it and you get calcification of the organs and a lot of crazy stuff that you don't want. D3 from UVB, you'll never get that because the body shuts it off. D3 through the diet, the body can't shut that off. And so it just keeps uh, absorbing the D3. And that's when you get an overdose situation. And so we chameleon people do not like calcium D3. Stay away from calcium with D3. We use uh, calcium through UVB. That's a safe way to do it. And that's the responsible way to do it. Now, they could be getting some D3. There is evidence they get D3 in their diet in the wild. And so I'm not saying that D3 in the diet is a bad thing. Uh, I certainly give it with uh, when I give vitamin A. And people have uh, uh, given vitamin D3 in the diet for a while. So there is a safety level there. The problem is we don't know where it is, where that safety level is. And giving it through UVB is within our power. And so we want to take advantage of that. And uh, calcium with D3 saves chameleons back when we didn't have UVB light. Um, and so we are grateful to them, but we're designed for an era, time era before where we are now. We have advanced UVB, so don't don't put D3 in with your calcium. Um, although make sure <laughs> you have the UVB, uh, good UVB uh, light. Let's see. Do, do, do. <laughs> Big Al, you speak wisdom. Yes, yes. Big Al knows. <laughs> he is absolutely correct. Oh, boy. Let's see. All right, all right. Um, oh, okay. Let's talk poop <laughs> about healthy bowel movements. Um, yeah, this is, uh, it's a great thing. Um looking at the poop is a way to uh, gauge the chameleon's health and uh you you got to start off with knowing what a good healthy poop looks like i know that's hard when you're you've only got uh you're only starting out but uh you can go on the chameleonacademy.com website and i do have healthy poop on there somewhere probably in the hydration section because uh, i do a lot of telling people to measure hydration by looking at the poop so it's pretty easy if your poop is moist nice tightly packed moist then uh, you, your chameleon's hydrated if it's a dry crisp then your chameleon's dehydrated uh, as for health uh, you can get a general idea of what's going on but it's not what you need is like three samples uh, before you know if it's a problem. Like if all of a sudden you get this diarrhea type just splash out, uh, that would be a, a concern unless you knew that you had your chameleon in a, an all-day rain shower and was feeding them hornworms. And then, yeah, you expect some crazy stuff out the back end. So uh, it's a great, great way to uh, monitor your chameleon's health. It's a challenge to uh specifically address that something what is going wrong so it helps you knowing that something is wrong not necessarily what is uh is exactly wrong and so uh it's a great way 
to uh, to know when to take uh, chameleon in for a vet visit to get uh, uh, to get tests done. Here is an interesting question: Are veils more or less intelligent than other chameleons? Uh, they're pretty intelligent as far as chameleons go. Uh, I say they're they're up there, and they will recognize you, and they will. Uh, and then if somebody else comes in the room, they're not going to like them. So I'd say they're on the uh, the higher side. Let's see. Are blueberries okay to gut load with? And when you're saying gut load, I'm assuming that you mean you're uh, uh, feeding them to the crickets because we gut load the crickets. Uh, if you're talking about giving them to the veiled chameleon, the veiled chameleon will eat blueberries. That is a fruit that is... Uh, it's not necessary to feed them fruit and we don't know how their system works with all of the sugars that are in the fruit. And so that's why I stay away from fruit. Um, I'm sure giving them a blueberry every now and then is not going to harm them at all. I have no idea at what point it will harm them or if it ever will. Uh, so big question mark on that. Uh, as far as my advice goes for the care summaries, since there's great question mark as to where the too much point is. And you do know that they don't need it. I say, I just say, don't do fruit at all. Uh, but that's more for just being safe. And, uh, but I can't say that it's going to, uh, more than three is going to be damaging. So I, I don't know. I don't know that anybody, anybody knows where that limit is. Um, All right. We'll do this one last question before I talk a little bit about care sheets here. Um, have a panther chameleon. Eh, okay, it'll be the same for a veiled chameleon. How much time outside the cage do you recommend when I take him out of his cage? Usually put him in a petri that I have as much as possible. Uh, as long as they have uh, cover from the sun, they can get away from the sun. Uh, the more they can be out there, the better. Um, so, I mean, that's just outdoors is magic for chameleons. It just is. So as much as possible. Now we've got to be careful because if we're, if you're just holding your panther chameleon and bringing them out, how much stress is that giving to your panther chameleon? And, <clears throat> and that answer is going to be different for every chameleon individual. You have to be perceptive enough to understand what your chameleon is going through. And I know that's a very difficult thing to ask people to do because uh, everybody, we all think that we know what we're talking about. We all think that we know our chameleon and we know it well, but one of those things where you don't know how much you don't know. And so uh, generally speaking, I say don't handle your chameleon because it takes a while before you understand what stress looks like in a chameleon. Uh, so you just got to make sure that this is a low stress situation. but if we just isolate outdoors time, uh, outdoors time is wonderful. Wonderful. I encourage as much as possible. Oh, all right. Uh, I do want to say about care sheets, uh, care sheets in general, and you can, you guys can see these, uh, these points at the end of my care summary. I actually go into it at the end. And I talk about how uh, you got to uh, consider these care summaries as a starting point, but they aren't the end all. Your chameleon is the expert in what they need. And just like human beings, some chameleons run will run cooler than others. Some chameleons will be thirstier than others. Every chameleon is an individual. And so once you have this care summary, this starts you off. Uh, most chameleons, almost all of the veiled chameleons will do perfectly under these conditions. But you need to listen to your chameleon. And if they tell you that they want something different by uh, staying under the heat lamp for longer than two hours, okay, this is getting excessive. What's going on? Or they keep drinking, 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 and they keep drinking, 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 but their poop is dry what's going on so you need to uh 
uh, be observant. Care sheet gets you set up. And after that, your chameleon's the expert. And don't be afraid of changing things if your chameleon is telling you that they need something different. Um, it's difficult to write that all down in a procedure. And if you see this, then do this because every chameleon is an individual and you need to get to know your chameleon. And that just takes time. So uh, what I'm saying is don't, don't worry about if your chameleon is telling you to do different things. Do what your chameleon says, not what the care sheet says. Then let's talk about conflicting opinions. If you are, there's, there are people out there that are going to disagree with the, what I have in this care summary. And it would be a lot of fun to get the people who say, oh, your basking temperature is too low. And so we'll get the 90 to 100 degree people in the room on one side. And then the people who say, oh, it's too high. It needs to be 80 degrees. We'll put them in the room and we can all have a cage match and fight it out. Um, and so usually all these people believe that their, their care sheet, the way they're doing it, is the absolute way to do it. And so you, it's very confusing for someone just trying to figure out how to take care of their chameleon to know, who do I talk to? I mean, you've literally got three people that you respect and they say totally different things. And not only that, they're saying the other people are wrong. What are you to do? There's no way for you to, you don't have the experience in the background to uh, to discern who to listen to. And to do this, uh, to um, work with this uh, and choose what you which way you're going to go with is figure out who's going to work with you the most. Because generally speaking, people have figured out how to work with what they do. Uh, big example is day misting versus night hydration. That's become a big thing in the community. And if you talk to somebody who believes religiously that you need to mist during the day and uh, you don't fog at night because foggers give respiratory infections, which they don't, um, then that person is not going to be able to help you with any scheme that has nighttime hydration, like what's on my care summary right now. Somebody who is insisting on misting during the day will look at this and say, oh, there's no way your chameleon is going to be hydrated. Well, that's wrong because what I have on my care summary works perfectly. But you're going to have to find somebody who, but if you talk to me, I'm going to tell you how to do that. And I figured out how to do that. Um, somebody who, and so everybody has their own way, own approach. Don't worry about what is universally right, wrong, or whatnot. And don't get involved in the fighting. Just figure out who you can work with, who is uh, can talk to you, will answer your questions, who you feel comfortable with, you think, okay, they've got this. And go with them. Go with what they say. If they want to do night uh, daytime misting, uh, let them tell you how to do it. If they talk about nighttime fogging, let them tell you how to do it and just go with it. And don't worry about all the other voices saying, oh, you can't do that. Once you have that system set up and you've worked with whoever, whatever system you decided to work with, and you've got your chameleon healthy and stable, then you have the time to explore all these different ideas. And you have the time to start picking them apart and saying, okay, I see the background for that one. I see the background for this one. And you can make your decisions once you have that experience uh, under your belt. And use the Chameleon Academy as a research tool. Uh, whether you decide to go with what I'm saying, what I've decided is best for me and what I can uh, present, whether you go with that or not, I present all of the reasons to support why I, I go, I, I've decided this. I give you the research that I have done so you can do the research and come to your own conclusion. You don't have to come to the same conclusion as I do. But what you do need to do is look at the amount of information that I have. You need to look at that information. And if you come to a different conclusion, we can talk about it. And you have a, uh, you have reasons for doing it. 
Uh, but uh, you, you that's the one thing about the Chameleon Academy. I present all that information to you. And, and you can learn a lot from the interviews. That's where I get a lot of my, uh, the information <clears throat> that's different than what I grew up with and what I used for 30 years. Um, and you can see me changing my mind. And saying, okay, now that makes sense. And you can decide, does that make sense to you? Is that enough for you to change your mind? So that's the wonderful thing about the podcasts is that you can learn along with me and go through the same steps that I did to get to where I am right now. When I started my podcast, I did a lot of day misting, but there were some questions that bothered me. As I got through the podcast and I was talking to different people and interviewing different people and working through different ideas, I mean, I would do that every week, uh, constantly challenging myself, I changed my approach. And if you listen to the podcasts, you will see that change. And I talk about the change and you can make your own decision. Now, I know there's over, I think over 250 podcasts right now. So that's a lot of information to go through. So I, I don't expect everybody to do that, but um, all I can say is that the information is there and you, uh, you're welcome to go through it and make your own, own conclusions. I put in as much of the detail into the, uh, the website as I can. Uh, if you go to the uh, care sheet, uh, you see at the top, there's a URL. Oh, let's go ahead. Uh, so yeah, so there's a URL at the top uh, of these uh, care summary. That's where you're going to, number one, that's where you can uh, download this care summary. But that's also where you can go for details into every section of this. I have this whole section on temperature where I talk about where those uh, numbers came from. Whole section on UEB talking about uh, where those numbers came from. And so you can go back and you can do your research on what is here and decide if that makes sense to you. So, uh, let's see, let's see what everybody else is uh, saying. Oh, hey, Steve Hefner joined. Hey, Steve uh, works on groups with me. Very helpful. It's great having him around. So, uh, and some people are talking about bioactive. Um, I'm actually going to be talking a lot about bioactive in the next couple of weeks. Uh, I really love the bioactive, um, but we, we need to talk about how it uh, fits in with chameleons. And, you know, it's great for baby chameleons, but how does it fit in with adult chameleons? Maybe, maybe not. Uh, but we're going to talk about that. But I got to tell you, having babies in bioactive, oh my goodness, it just changes the whole, whole situation. It's wonderful. So... Oh, all right, everybody. It is coming to the end. Uh, we're actually past the end, but that's okay. I want to thank you very much, everyone, for being here and uh, being along, enjoying this journey of learning about chameleons together. And as is, I, I've got you a 2022 updated. And so I've updated this chameleon, Veiled Chameleon Care Summary about twice now since I launched it first in uh, the end of uh, the end of 2019. So it's a dynamic document because I constantly push my chameleon husband forward and these care sheets are going to reflect that. So I in, I, I'll be here in 2023 or 2024 with the updated Bill Chameleon Air Summary. So I don't, I don't offer you stability here, but I do offer you uh, the latest in husbandry. So thank you, everybody. Know that uh, next week we're starting on uh, the chameleon environment. That's going to be the theme. And uh, join me uh, every every morning at 6 a.m. Uh, Pacific time. You get that uh, that video, video touch point every single morning, except for Sunday. Uh, and, and then on Saturday, uh, we have the finale of a, a larger, a longer video and this live session to talk about it. So uh, join me uh, for every weekday. And I will see you uh, Monday. Bye, everybody.